Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, there may be dark clouds over startup land, but two of tech's hottest startup sites are joining forces to weather the storm. We will speak to Product Hunt's Ryan Hoover. Plus, our exclusive with Carlos Slim, Mexico's richest man, lays out his views on Donald Trump, Mexico, and the biggest threat to his telecom empire. And after lagging in navigation, Apple gets serious about taking on Google Maps and enlists backup from above. We'll explain. First to our lead. Two of the coolest kids in Silicon Valley startup scene are getting together. AngelList is buying Product Hunt to create a one-stop shop for tech entrepreneurs. AngelList is a website that young tech startups use to raise money from investors. And Product Hunt is a popular site for entrepreneurs looking to stay in the know about up-and-coming apps. Product Hunt had already counted AngelList's CEO, Naval Ravikant, among its big-name investors in terms of the deal were not disclosed. Joining us now to discuss the tie-up, Product Hunt founder Ryan Hoover with me here in the studio, as well as Bloomberg Tech's venture capital reporter Sarah McBride. Thanks to both of you Hi. for joining us. So Ryan, why sell, why now? You know, so I've known Naval now for a while and he's an investor in Product Hunt, so he, he's believed in us since the very beginning. And it was just the right time right now for us as a company to, to partner with them. And we're thinking about our long-term future, talking more with AngelList and what their plans are. And there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together to ultimately help startups in different ways, not only from funding to talent to distribution and discovery. Now, as I understand it, you were also trying to raise money. I'm curious what you found in the fundraising environment. What's it like? Were you having any trouble? You know, the fundraising environment, there's a lot of talk about it. There has been for the past two years, really, and it's certainly changed in many ways. But today, really, companies, great companies are getting funded uh, still today. We're seeing more and more people building products, building companies, and also with less resources, less time. And we're also living in a world where there are distribution channels that exist, the internet, of course, but also the app store, Amazon, all these different places to actually distribute your products. So despite all this talk about the fundraising environment being difficult, the truth is, it's actually a great time to be a maker and a, and a company builder. So like, why did you sell rather than raise more? Right now, you know, when we look at our strategy, like where are we going long term? If you look even 10 years out down the road, how do we get there faster? And many of it's through partnerships, and partnerships with AngelList make a lot of sense. We were looking towards revenue plans and things like that, and AngelList has a fantastic talent platform. They've invested a lot into it and continue to invest in a lot, and that's something that we can see being a part of uh, Product Hunt and AngelList together down the road. Now, Sarah, Bloomberg has a new measurement out, the Bloomberg right. Startups Barometer, which you say is down 15% from a high of last year. What exactly is this startups barometer? What does it mean? Okay, the startups barometer is a set of four different points that Bloomberg looks at. We've gone back years to figure out the data from a long time ago. And the four points I'll just show you on this screen are the number of deals, the amounts that um, those deals raise, how many of them are first financings? That's a really important metric of how healthy the industry is in the future, and also the number of exits. So simply how many have been acquired or how many have IPO'd. So Bloomberg you know, mixes that all together with its secret sauce and comes <laughs> up with this uh, barometer. It's a very special sauce. Yep. Um, <laughs> would you echo what you're hearing from investors and entrepreneurs, uh, would you echo what Ryan just said about the environment? I might be a little bit less optimistic than <laughs> Ryan. I'm hearing that it's much harder to raise. If you look at the numbers, you see that far fewer companies are raising Series A and at seed level, which is a leading indicator, will show a slowdown um, of those big exits in the future. But also, it's a little bit hard to tell because some of those funding rounds are actually going up in size. So fewer of them, but sometimes bigger. So for companies that aren't kind of blockbuster, it's a little bit hard to get funding right now. For the startups, Ryan, mm -hmm. you know, that you know that maybe are in, you know, in this sort of transition period or, or middle ground, what are they doing? I mean, what are they planning? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who, I mean, obviously cutting costs is the easiest way to extend your runway to get to that point where you, you have that hockey stick growth where you can actually raise around. So we're seeing that. I mean, there's there's also, um, you know, people do shut down companies. When it doesn't work out, that's that's what you ultimately end up doing or raise a bridge around. 
Um, so it's, it's something that's the environment's change. We go through these, these periods ultimately. And to take it back to even AngelList, this is exactly what AngelList was founded on to start with, is to help companies and investors connect and raise money to, to, to live. Right. So the funding environment is shifting. The political environment has changed. How does this play out, Sarah? I mean, do we see more acquisitions, more tie-ups like this? Um, do we see, you know, sort of the cream rising to the top, if you will? I guess it's a cream rises to the top uh, situation when the environment gets different, difficult. People say a really good company can IPO no matter what, but then there are just these events that are causing a lot of problems. I mean, if you look at this barometer, you'll see around here in the summer, this is right after Brexit, um, that was just kind of an unforeseen complication that hit all kinds of markets hard, including the startup market. Um, so it's very difficult to tell what this administration's going to be like and how that'll end up affecting startups. So, Brian, you're going to be working closely with Naval Ravikant, the CEO mm -hmm. of AngelList. What are the plans you guys are charting out for the next year in terms of what a tie-up looks like and how mm -hmm. you actually help startups given uh, the environment we're looking at? So a lot of things will, certainly things will change, but a lot of it will stay the same, actually. And this is early conversation with Naval during this, this whole process is, what is your vision of, of AngelList and what is our vision and how do they come together? And so for the short term, not much will change. Our roadmap is staying the same. The community is intact. The site is still there. And that's our long-term plan. The way I equate this really is thinking about what, is, what did it look like when Facebook bought Instagram? You looked at that and, and you would think, I thought, that Instagram would be gobbled up and turned into Facebook photos. Mm -hmm. But quite the opposite happened. You know, it's remained independent to some extent and it's grown to become a massive, massive platform within that ecosystem of Facebook itself. Interesting. All right. Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt, you are sticking with me. You're going to talk to me a little bit about Great. Snap Spectacle. Sarah McBride, our venture capital reporter, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. Another story we are watching, Box topped its third quarter results and raised its forecast for 2017, driven by large orders and deals, plus a new product push. I sat down with CEO Aaron Levy to talk about what is fueling growth. One of the cool things about our product is, is that it uh, makes sense for any size business in any industry anywhere around the world. So we do see pretty dramatic expansion simply happening because of new customers coming on board. We now have 69,000 uh, businesses that use the product. At the same time, we're seeing continued expansion within existing accounts. So some of our new products that we launched throughout the past year and a half um, that are sort of add-on products in terms of, of the revenue model uh, have actually been performing very well. Coming up, we get our hands on Snap Spectacles. Thanks to Snap investor Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed. His insights on the product next. This is Bloomberg. There's been a major shakeup at Starbucks. Howard Schultz is stepping down as CEO next year, but staying on as executive chairman. The high-profile executive built the coffee empire and served two separate stints as chief executive officer. He's being replaced by Kevin Johnson, who currently serves as COO. Johnson is known as a tech veteran before joining Starbucks in 2009 as an executive at Microsoft and Juniper Networks. Since Johnson became chief operating officer, Starbucks has rolled out mobile ordering across the U.S. and even tested delivery. Investors are rushing to snap up shares of Snapchat's parent company ahead of next year's IPO, but they're having little luck with the typical sources of private stock, like employees and other investors. This is according to a report by The Information. Consumers are facing the same challenges as they scout out the company's first hardware product, Spectacles. We were able to get our hands on the elusive specs. Snap's first investor, Jeremy Liu of Lightspeed, brought over a pair for a test run. How did you get your spectacles? So uh, I have a I, feeling you did not wait in line for six hours. I, uh, I have some friends at Snapchat and I called in a favor. If you don't have friends at Snapchat, the only way to get your hands on Snap's new camera-clad spectacles is to stand in line for hours at pop-up vending machines across the country. $130 a pair or up to thousands on eBay. Let's do it. Lightspeed's okay. Jeremy Liu was a lucky one. He's one of Snap's first investors, so he didn't have to wait. How does it work? 
So uh, there's a little button here on the top, and when I press it, it starts recording video. And you can see the light's gone on, so you yeah. know that you're being recorded right now. And after uh, it stops, then uh, it syncs through Bluetooth to my phone. So when I open my Snapchat app, it'll sync through to uh, get the video directly into Snapchat. The specs come in edgy colors, teal and coral, and a more muted black and charge when clicked into the case with a rechargeable battery. They've got a certain cool factor, but you gotta wonder if spectacles will actually make a cool dent in Snap's business. When you heard that Snapchat was going to make something like this, was going to get into hardware, what did you think? What I found is that uh, Evan and the team there have just demonstrated that they know better than anyone else what their users will want. My turn. <laughs> All yours. Let me know Give what you think. Give it a try. And you're recording. Oh, I'm recording. Can you see the little white? In oh, the yeah. Of your hey. Eye? The camera records circular video, allowing you to hold your phone vertically or horizontally to see the scene. So I went zip lining with my daughter and not having to worry about dropping a camera or a phone, but being able to record that experience, it was really pretty fantastic. So why do you think spectacles will do any better than these? I Google think Glass. Kind of obvious just looking at them, <laughs> don't you? Obvi, right? Remember Google Glass retailed at $1,500, more than 11 times more than Spectacles. It could do a lot more things, though. Jeremy Liu believes that Snap's price point will help get the product into the hands of the masses. But will Spectacles be able to have long-term staying power? I want to bring back Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt. So you haven't tried it. Not yet. But so. you just saw our little experience there. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. What do you think? So I think it's it's a brilliant move. I mean, Snapchat is, is executing so well on so many different levels, and it's very difficult for especially a software company to execute on hardware, and they're doing it in a very snap kind of way. They're doing it by making it a toy, making it playful, making it fun, and also, of course, introducing a price point that's accessible for a lot of people. Brilliant is a strong word. Really? Brilliant? I think it is. Even even the execution of their distribution. They're they're creating these vending machines. I mean, vending machines, when, since when were vending machines cool? Somehow they made vending machines kind of cool and also a marketing campaign by dropping them in different cities. They're they're making them feel very exclusive, that's yes. for sure. I mean, I will say that I walked into it feeling very skeptical, but I could certainly see, A, uh, you would love these if you were a huge Snapchat user because it's just so easy to get the video to your phone and then into your app. Mm -hmm. um, B, if you have kids, uh, it sort of takes away that awkward moment when you pull out your phone and your kid yeah. automatically stops doing that cute thing that they were doing that you wanted to get a picture of. But do you think this is actually something that's going to add revenue to the bottom line or drive usage well, in, a, in, a, in a big way? Yeah, long term, I believe this movement, it's not necessarily Spectacles, the first product, the first version that necessarily will, but it's the first step towards a hardware snap company, a camera company, how Evan puts it. And you know, starting with something simple that just takes photos versus Google, they approach it with a very complex and very expensive product from the beginning. So you think it's more than just a gimmick, something fun? something fun around the holidays. I, I think this is actually more the future of what Snap is actually building. And it gives them a lot more flexibility to own the entire experience for the, for the user as well. That said, gadgets in general are kind of struggling. I mean, Google Glass didn't work out. Uh, you have Pebble potentially selling to Fitbit. You have GoPro. Uh, they just had a, a number of layoffs. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's it really going to take to, to make some of these techie gadgets, aside from your smartphone, really mm -hmm. take off? I mean, not many people can execute on that, especially execute on software and hardware very, very well. But if they can, it becomes so much more valuable. If you can own the entire experience and the platform and actually not depend on longer term Apple or, or Google and Android and other devices, then it becomes even more uh, exciting as a product builder. What sort of trends are you seeing at Product Hunt between hardware versus software startups? So we're seeing a lot more, I mean, smart everything is, is coming and, and it's been you know part of the meme and the conversation for a long time, but we're seeing more and more smart things, whether it's like smart lighting and, and we have Google Home and we have smart ovens and all these different things that are connected to the internet that do interesting things. And we're still super early in that space. Uh, people are still exploring what can you do when you connect things to the internet. All right, Ryan Hoover, CEO of Product Hunt. Thanks so much for stopping Thanks. by. Great to have you here on the show.
All right, a number of voices are chiming in to talk about what U.S. innovation will look like under President-elect Trump. And today we heard from Bill Nye. He weighed in on, the technology, on technology's role in the U.S. economy earlier today on Bloomberg Surveillance. Take a listen. You can hate me, you can hate everything, you can be a miserable hater person, but what keeps the United States in the game is our technology, our innovation. So let us, I hear, I'm hoping that we can find common ground on this. Invest in basic research. Uh, if we had better batteries, we would change the world. And if we invested in renewable energy technologies, then we would be having jobs right here in the United States. Coming up, if you've been thinking of a career change, we'll show you how to start earning an income through your Instagram account. And Bloomberg Tech is moving to a new time. Starting on Monday, we will be live 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, an hour earlier, 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. Do not miss us. This is Bloomberg. A story we are watching, Airbnb is toughening, toughening up home sharing limits in London and Amsterdam. Hosts will now need a license to rent their homes in London for more than 90 days a year and for 60 days a year in Amsterdam. This is coming at a time when the platform faces increasing pressure from cities and governments. Airbnb will automatically limit home listings on its platform from 2017. And turning now to Instagram, it is an app where filters help average people make their lives appear more glamorous or fun, with some everyday users striking rich thanks to millions of followers. But in this week's Bloomberg Business Week, our reporter Max Chafkin discovers that being Insta-famous is hard work. My colleague David Gurr asked him about it. Take a listen. Max, you're like me. You were like me uh, with a small amount of followers. You wanted to up that. What did you set out to do here? Uh, how did you set out to become Insta-famous? So my goal here was to sort of determine, as you say, just how hard this is. Is, is it something that anyone can do? Um, there are these people, they are, they're called influencers, is the, is the term of art. Um, they basically uh, take money from, from marketers to, to try to sell stuff. And I found um, an agency that, that sort of advised me on photography and, uh, and, and grooming and clothing and various other matters. And I, uh, you know, just started posting these uh, pictures on Instagram in a totally different character. Um, I also used uh, bots to try to, uh, you know, juice my following. Um, and, you know, it was, as you say, it was, uh, it was difficult. And, um, you know, it both gave me an appreciation for this stuff. It also, I think, showed me just how contrived some of it is. We're seeing you there with, uh, with your cat. I, I cannot imagine why that was not leading to more followers. And I, I I want to make no offense here, the, the, the stylists, the groomers, they had their work cut out uh, with you. They did a lot of work uh, to make you somebody who would get more followers on Instagram. You know, that, that hurts, but I, I'll, I take your <laughs> point. <laughs> you know, how does this service, how do these services work? You go uh, with a couple hundred followers asking to become an influencer, willing to pay for that to happen. Uh, normally, you have to have a rather high threshold to be able to do that. So how does one become uh, at the lowest level, at the entry level, a member of what you call Instagram's professional class? So yeah, I mean these these agencies, these the, the sort of pro the professionals that provide services to these influencers, they, they normally don't talk to anybody with less than like a hundred thousand followers. Um, you know, they, they basically made an exception, uh, you know, for the purposes of my article. Um, the, uh, the the in interesting thing with Instagram, which is sort of different from Twitter, is there's like no easy way to get a following. Uh, you, you know, there's no retweets, there's no sort of easy way to be rebroadcast. So basically, what we have to do is like you know jump around the internet, uh, you know, liking things in the hopes that some of those people um, like you back uh, and and then try to have something that is is worth looking at which were these you know slightly ridiculous uh, pictures that I, uh, I you know I took with the help of, of some you know photography and some stylists and some great lighting um, and yeah I mean there's there's certainly like a genre of this and it, it, it kind of looks a little bit like a you know paparazzi shot or something like that but the thing that was you know most discouraging was just that um, you know, these pictures that I had taken before on Instagram that I really was proud of, I mean, they did nothing compared to these, like, kind of slightly cheesy fashion shoots that I, that I did later, which, which performed much, much, much better. I think they look great, Max. I'm struck here as we look at photos from your Instagram account, some credit here to Alicia Siegel. Uh, explain here uh, how this works. Right. There, there is a lack of genuineness to Instagram that I pick up on. I post pictures of my kids smiling, not her having a temper tantrum, for instance. But when I look at your bowl of granola there, not a photo that you took yourself. 
it's a beautiful bowl of granola, no, but I did not eat it. Um, and I can't really tell you what that yellow blob on top Some is. Some sort of custard. Um, Basically, I was uh, I was posting these fashion shoots, and then I was also trying to post, you know, pictures that I thought kind of looked like what you'd sort of expect would be on Instagram. And my, you know, advisor said, you know, these are are frankly terrible. You need professional help. So there's like a, a, a class of photographers that basically just sell, you know, lifestyle content to Instagram influencers as if it were like a magazine. Bring it, Max Chack and our Bloomberg Business Week reporter with my colleague. David Gura today earlier on Bloomberg Markets. You can catch Max's full story in this week's issue of Bloomberg Business Week. It's a good one. Coming up, the folks behind Peter Thiel's fellowship program have a new venture firm. How they plan to find the next Mark Zuckerberg next. Harvey, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with the check of your first word news. Starting with France, French President Francois Hollande says he will not seek another term in 2017. The embattled leader has seen his popularity hit record lows after a number of terrorist attacks. Hollande made the announcement today in a televised address. And Thailand has a new king. The country's crown prince formally takes the throne to succeed his revered late father, who reigned for 70 years. The new monarch will be known as Rama, the 10th king in the dynasty founded in 1782. Former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair plans to invest $10 million in a new policy institute to fight the rise of populism. The Tony Blair Institute will serve as a platform to craft policy for the so-called center ground. Now that's the area in the political spectrum that's neither to the right or to the left. Blair's been a controversial figure in the UK for bringing Britain into the Iraq war. Well, hundreds of victims have reported child sex abuse within British football clubs. That's according to the BBC, citing the National Police Chiefs Council, which reports receiving a significant number of calls after former players made allegations of abuse against coaches. The council says more than 860 people have called a hotline it set up just one week ago when the allegations emerged. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Christine Harvey. This is Bloomberg. Now, it's just after 7.30 a.m. here in Hong Kong, 10.30 a.m. in Sydney. Bloomberg's Paul Allen joins me now with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Tell us what's going on out there. Morning, Christine. We're off to a fairly weak start on the ASX. Uh, we're down about a quarter of 1% right now. Take a look at the organic food producer Bellamy's, though. That's uh, lost about a third of its value in the first half hour of trade after flagging weaker revenues uh, out of China. A better story for Grain Corp. Uh, Grain Corp up about one and a quarter percent. This is after the US giant Archer Daniels Midland flagged that it's going to be selling its near 20% stake in Grain Corp at uh, $8.53 per share. It's a pretty good discount of about 2% on Thursday's close for Grain Corp. Iron ore price has been behaving very weirdly. It's almost doubled in value this year, but uh, take a look at the action uh, on Thursday night. It was back up almost 9%, uh, reversing its steepest decline in two years just a day earlier. A lot of uh, analysts there speculating about speculation, much as you'd expect. A uh, quick look at the NZX over in New Zealand. That's looking flat right now. Nikkei futures also looking flat. And we've had a bit of data out of South Korea this morning. Third quarter GDP, 2.6% narrow missing estimates. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Silicon Valley heavyweight and Trump transition team member Peter Thiel is known for being a contrarian, to say the least, when it comes to everything from politics to his investing philosophy. His Thiel Fellowship gives $100,000 grants to two dozen college-age students each year on the condition that they drop out and start companies. Two people behind the fellowship have started their own venture fund called the 1517 Fund with the aim of taking things a step further. Joining me now to discuss 1517 Fund co-founders and general partners, Danielle Strachman and Michael Gibson. You guys have been at this for about a year and a half now, and you've both been working with Peter for a long time, six yep. years or so. So talk to me about how this fund actually works. I know it's, it's seed, pre-seed to stage, but how is it different from a, a typical venture fund? So as far as a typical venture fund, all venture funds have some sort of um, goal or mission that they're trying to achieve. Ours happens to be focused on younger founders who are in high school and college and helping them to build their companies. So you really are looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg because you are looking for people who are really young. Yep. So uh, you know, talk to me, Michael, a little bit about the people who are backing you because as I understand it, it's not necessarily for returns. Well, they are interested in, in this mission to find people who are working on things outside of tracked institutions. We, we're not against education in and of itself. We believe in learning by doing and the types of individuals who are so committed and passionate about what they're working on that they're prepared to leave school. They tend to be really interesting, dynamic people. And so a lot of our investors are interested in talking to and working with those are the people we funded. Yeah. And you've been working with the Teal Fellowship since the early days, very yeah. controversial idea. What drew you to this idea that kids should not go to school, they should start companies instead? Uh, I've personally worked in alternative education for a long time. I worked with homeschoolers and also started a charter school that has an ethos of learning by doing. Uh, so I was personally drawn to the Teal Fellowship because it's the same thing of learning by doing, going out there and starting something, uh, and also making sure that young adults are not infantilized for too long is really important to me. What kind of success have the Teal Fellows actually had? I mean, so have you the, found this is actually a good formula? Yeah, absolutely. So for the fellows who started companies, uh, a lot of them are tracking very strongly now. Uh, you know, all told, I think, I, I forget the exact number, but it's north of a billion dollars in market cap aggregate of some of the companies started by fellows. And we're really excited to see the next wave. The tailwinds are really in our favor. We see younger people starting programming by, you know, at the age of 12, and by the time we meet them, maybe they have eight years' experience. They're getting, they have role models that they can copy and emulate, and so we expect to see a lot more great companies come from. What about the times when it doesn't work out? Because obviously it doesn't work out for everyone. You know, is it then, has it been a waste of time? Have they learned something? How do, get, these are kids, right, overcome? So for these young people, there are a lot of opportunities for them. If they start a startup and it doesn't go in the direction they want to, there are lots of opportunities, whether it be hiring, going back to school, um, those are two in particular, but being out there and being able to say to someone at the age of 18 or 20 years old, I've been out there, I've raised money, I've you know, managed a team and things like that, that's a lot more experience than a lot of young people get. So I think the opp opportunities are still very bright for them no matter what happens. So Peter himself is an investor mm -hmm. in the fund, right? What has he told you about what he hopes to see, what he'd like? I think he loves that this is an extension of, of the theme behind the fellowship, which is really supporting people outside of these institutions, helping them on extraordinary careers without any kind of authentication by some authority. Uh, the name of our fund, 1517, comes from the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the little inside joke there is that uh, Martin Luther nailed his theses to a church door. Uh, protesting the sale of indulgences. These were pieces of paper the church sold at great cost, telling people it was a way to save their souls. Likewise, we say that universities are selling a piece of paper called a diploma, telling people it's the only way they can save their souls. Mm -hmm. And we think it was false then and it's false now. And I think that message and mission really resonated with Peter. Teal uh, has, as we've heard, been trying to get some support in Silicon Valley, get some folks on a team to help advise President-elect Trump. Has he asked either of you? I know he's tapped some of the fellows. Have not been asked. <laughs> what do you make of his support for Donald Trump, which, again, Peter's a very you know, contrarian views, as we know, and very much against the grain of the rest of Silicon Valley? We were surprised like everybody else. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't speculate beyond Peter's public statements yeah. for reasons of support. I think it ties into a lot of the themes that he's been thinking about. So at broad economic innovative stagnation across long periods of time and you know, beyond what he's said in public about shaking things up, I can't speculate. But. Are you guys excited about Donald Trump or are you nervous? Uh, as a small L libertarian, I tend to uh, look at different ways of reforming institutions huh. than uh, democratic votes. And uh, I, I don't know, I'd look for other opportunities, but I, I hope things work out. On that note, you are on the board of the Seasteading Institute, which I have to ask you about. So yep. this is, the idea is they're doing research, right, mm -hmm. to build a city or island off the coast of California where you would start over, you'd have your own new rules, new laws. It was mm -hmm. parodied on HBO's Silicon Valley. Right. Yep. What's, the, what's the actual progress been? So uh, it's not specifically to build a floating island off the coast of California. It's really about there's no more le land left in this world for people to try new experiments and governance on. Uh, the idea isn't for pure anarchy, no rules. The idea is can we try new rule sets? Uh, and so there is some good news this week. The Seasteading Institute has come to an agreement with the French Polynesian government, a memorandum of understanding. Uh, that would allow for the first uh, creation of a zone in their coastal waters uh, for a platform where people might be able to run businesses under a different set of rules. So do you believe it will happen? And if so, when? Like how Absolutely. Far I mean, seasteading is happening right now. The Chinese are building artificial islands in the Pacific. They don't call them seasteads, and they operate according to Chinese law. But I, inevitably, in the next 50 years, there will be people who build structures at sea that operate according to different rules. So California, you think 50 years? Or so, it'll be off the coast of California. I, I hope so, for our sake. All right, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Mike Gibson and Danielle yeah. Strachman of the 1517 Fund. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, guys, okay. for stopping by. Thank Great. You. A story we are watching. State-sponsored hackers have carried out a wave of destructive attacks on Saudi Arabia over the last two weeks. According to people familiar with the investigation, the hackers broke into the agency that runs Saudi Arabia's airports and erased data. They're also believed to have hit five other targets. Though the investigation is still in its early stages, digital evidence reportedly suggests the attacks came from Iran. Authorities say no air travel or airport operations were disrupted by the attack, but it was believed to be a show of force. We'll pick up on state-sponsored hacking tomorrow with FireEye's Director of Threat Intelligence, Laura Galante. She says Russian hackers did more than leak DNC emails. They helped spread fake news stories on social media. Do not miss that conversation tomorrow. Up next, Apple Maps hasn't been exactly a darling of the tech world, but the company is putting a lot of resources behind it, now including drones to improve the service and take on Google. We'll bring you that story coming up. How bad is this? Be honest, is this Windows Vista bad? It's not iPhone 4 bad, is it? <laughs> Don't tell me this is Zoom bad. I'm sorry, Gavin. It's Apple Maps bad. <laughs> As that clip from HBO Silicon Valley shows, Apple Maps hasn't exactly been loved by its users. Since it launched in 2012, it's been riddled with errors, leaving it with a lackluster reputation as Google Maps has dominated the space. But Apple is making serious moves to change all that. Mark Gurman wrote about it for Bloomberg Technology. He joins me now here. So now they're using drones uh, to try to take Apple Maps to the ne next level. How will this work? Right, and let's step back a little bit. So Apple Maps, obviously the launch was bungled, but one of the reasons uh, that it was so you know, terrible at launch is because they had so much data that they were pulling together from different providers, some providers including TomTom Tom and other smaller companies, and they didn't source their own data. So a couple of years ago, they hit the streets with vans, very similar to Google. What Google has done, right? Right, what Google's done for a decade, and they're collecting their own data using camera sensors. But vans can only take you so far. They're very expensive, they require a lot of manpower, but drones, you know, they're smaller, they're under 50 pounds, they can fly around and really get into areas that vans cannot. So they've turned to drones. So they've gotten FAA approval to do this. Right, earlier this year they got FAA approval um, 
in August, FAA stopped requiring exemptions and approval to fly commercially, but Apple started looking into this earlier in the year. They got approval in March, and so this allows them to you know, fly drones around. But the key here is they can't go over buildings or over people yet, so they're limited for the time being to regions that are not regulated, such as Amazon using the UK for some prime air mm -hmm. testing. But over time, the FAA is going to relax their restrictions, obviously, so Apple will be able to do more. Does Google use drones? Google, they've done drones some through their Skunk Works programs, uh -huh. uh, but other companies have done this before. It's actually a popular technique for really surveying, construction sites use it. You can actually see lots of people flying drones with cameras over Apple's campus mm. to try to get a look at how far it's, it's gone so far in terms mm -hmm. of construction. So there's been lots of maps and construction related applications for drones in the past. Right, we're looking forward to that campus opening next year. So they're also adding some new features, indoor features, features for pedestrians, Tell me about these. Right. So beyond the drones, which is a long-term initiative to improve the data, they're working on at least two new features for an iOS update next year. One of the features would be indoor mapping. So over the last couple of years, Apple's been using Wi-Fi, this technology for sensors called iBeacons, to sort of map out high traffic, high volume places like malls, airports, big museums, parks and such. And now, or not now, when they release this feature as soon as next year, you'll be able to navigate these places with the maps up on your phone, just like you can navigate walking. Another feature is for the in-car navigation. So right now the Google Maps app will tell you, hey, you need to get in these two lanes in order to make it to your turn or your next exit on the freeway. Now Apple Maps will be able to do that next year. So how optimistic are you about this? I know you also talked about them assembling a new team, robotics experts, data experts, but do you think they're really putting in enough resources here to, to take on Google. What I can tell you is that it very much appears that Apple is taking this super seriously because Maps is not a financial element of the company. They don't rely on it like they rely on the iPhone. But it is a key platform as part of the iPhone, and they really are showing dedication to this. Don't forget, Apple had a bad launch, but that was years after Google's launch. And when Google Maps launched, it was just the United States and a few other places. And Apple has progressed, honestly, so much over the last five years, mm -hmm. but there is so much room to still grow to match Google. All right. Well, hopefully they don't get another spot on Silicon Valley for that reason, at least. Mark Gurman, great reporting, as always, of Bloomberg Tech. Sticking with Apple for a moment, chip makers dropped the most in five months after a report that Apple is reducing orders for iPhone 7 parts. This according to Digitimes. As you can see, among the worst hit today were Broadcom, Qualcomm, Texas Instruments in Thursday trade. Coming up, Carlos Slim, America Mobile Chairman Emeritus and one of the richest men in the world, joins us from Mexico City and takes on AT&T's aggressive pricing strategies in Mexico. This is Bloomberg. Billionaire Carlos Slim, Mexico's richest person, joined us earlier for an exclusive interview from Mexico City. The America Mobile Chairman Emeritus says AT&T's aggressive pricing strategies in Mexico are causing the company to, quote, lose a lot of money. He also chimed in on U.S. President-elect Trump, saying Mexico needs to return its focus inward after his presidential win. Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker caught up with Slim from the Mexico Year Ahead Summit 2017. Take a listen. Well, uh, we are mainly in Latin America. Uh, we have a big operation in U.S. and uh, something in, in, in Europe. And uh, we always uh, take care of our investments because we cannot uh, get behind in technology, in capacity, uh, to, have, to offer to our customers the best service, and we cannot stop this uh, because of any reason. Does well, it gets sometimes it gets cheaper because now we pay less for what we are going to do in dollar terms. In dollar terms, will be lower, but in local currencies, will be it's cheaper, higher. Um, the the concerns that you have mm. about the effect of Trump policies on the domestic economy and America's standing in the world does that change the calculus that you may have for some of your assets in the United States? You own a very no. large wireless, a prepaid wireless company, TrackPhone. No, I think uh, uh, there is any change about, uh, about that. No, he's talking about uh, climate change. Let's look what he's going to mm -hmm. do. 
because he's not telling that he will get out of climate change. That's very important. Uh, about the leadership of U.S., but one side he said that he will get out of everywhere, but by the other side he wants to make a stronger army, a stronger uh, military mm -hmm. uh, comp country, and maybe he's looking to, to negotiate the, the resources that will pay for that. He has told that they will charge to some other countries. Thus, I think it's an issue of negotiations, negotiations to make a, a U.S. pay less for many of these things. What is but the, he's talking about corruption in Washington. That's good for our country. Yeah, that's good for everyone. Rooting out corruption. Yes. I would like to think rooting out corruption is good for everybody. I know. Well, he said corruption that is the, the lobbying of uh, uh, ex-officials of government and Congress. Mm. Um, I mentioned this business you have, TrackPhone. What's the long-term strategy for that business? Is it to continue as it is now, to maybe merge it with a wireless carrier, or perhaps to sell it at some point? In the point? short term, it's uh, follow like we are doing. We need to follow what is happening in the in industry. It, the, the industry is moving very fast, and uh, we are uh, alert of what is moving, what is coming. And uh, depending on all these things, uh, we will take a decision in his right moment. So what's more likely to happen in the longer term? The longer term is very difficult to, to define in this mm -hmm. moment. Uh, but uh, we are uh, working in the short term to, to what we have done to make it profitable. They have a, a good uh, uh, operation, a good market share, etc. And here in Mexico, your former partner in Telmex, AT&T, is now the greatest threat yes. to, your, to your wireless business. Is AT&T playing fair? We know that uh, they, uh, they were going to come to compete because we opened the door. Uh, we opened the door, like you know, they have a, a big piece of, uh, for many years, of, uh, of uh, uh, America Mobile. Yes. Uh, at the, since the beginning, in 91, they have 10%. Actually, in 91, they have 10% of tel Telmex, and those, those times was Telmex. And uh, we, we opened the door to them buying his part. If we don't buy the part, they will not be here because they were, were not legal. And uh, they are getting very aggressive, maybe a little more than what is in Telmex. They are losing a lot of money. I don't know how much, but they are losing a lot of money. You can see that in the balance sheets. Winning market. Uh, uh, that's uh, the strategy they, they uh, take. Uh, what is very surprised, and that's for me a surprise, is that they are selling very, very low price here, less than 50% of the price in US. That means that uh, it's a surprise that they are selling, not at the American, at the US prices, but less than 50% of the price in US. Is that anti-competitive behavior? I don't know. You you need you make your 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 judge it. I think you know more about those regulators than I do. Um, but what can you do? What can America Mobile do to stop AT and T from taking your market share if they oh. continue to price at that level? No, they are not taking too much market. Uh, uh, they are subsidizing too much the handsets. Uh, they are taking well. They are taking some market also from competitors. But as much as it is good for the consumers, we are happy. That was America Mobile Chairman Emeritus Carlos Slim with our very own Eric Schatzker in Mexico City. In this edition of Out of This World, the International Space Station lost another supply mission. An unmanned Russian spacecraft with nearly 5,400 pounds of food, equipment and personal effects took off from Kazakhstan Thursday morning. Six minutes into the flight, though, the rocket exploded 118 miles above the ground. The Russian space agency said most of the debris, the debris burned in the atmosphere. The six-person crew aboard the ISS right now is not in immediate danger of running out of food. The station is stocked for an event such as this. And in fact, this is the fourth failed cargo mission in just over two years. The next supply mission will come from Japan on December 9th. That does it for today. And a reminder, Bloomberg Tech is moving to a new time. Starting on Monday, the show will be live, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg.